Amen. Great to see you tonight, Bible Baptist. Those of you are here and those that are streaming with us online, we are so glad to have you join us. Uh, here in just a moment, we're going to have a video, and Dr. Sam will be with us again tonight. And uh, let's, so let's join the together in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we just praise your name. And Lord, we thank you for the wonderful services you've allowed us to have today. Uh, Lord, we don't take lightly that we are allowed to come and meet together in your house. So, Father, we just thank you for that. And, Lord, we just ask that again that you would be with tonight's services, Lord. Uh, Lord, Give Brother Steve the words to say, Lord, and, Lord, that we would open our hearts to your word, Lord, and we would make decisions, uh, Lord, to follow you this very night. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. This time I'd ask that you would watch the screens. God is so good, God is so good, I'm gonna eat a hot dog, God is so good, just right. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Oh, hey kids, how are you guys doing today? Well. We're out here and it's sprinkling. We've got this tent. And we're going to be talking about how, as humans, we need protection. So, we need protection in this harsh weather and the different things that we face here on Earth. But I'm going to tell you a story. When I was a kid and we used to live in Massachusetts, I told my dad, Dad, I'm going to go and stay outside, and it was snowing. And he said, Son, you'll freeze outside. And I was like, Oh, Dad, I can do it. I know I can. So he set up a tent just like this, and I got all bundled up in all of my stuff. And then I went outside, and I started getting ready to go to bed. And then it started snowing really bad, and it was getting cold. Man, I didn't even last an hour. And I was running back to the house, knocking on the door, saying, Dad, Dad, please let me in. I can't sleep outside. It's too cold. So we can we see that storms really do affect us and that we do need protection from the harsh weather. Well, this past few weeks, we've been talking about our six-week series on the basics of life. And our first series, we talked about food and the Bible. And then our second lesson, we talked about air and prayer. And in our third lesson, we talked about water and worship. And then in our fourth lesson, which was last week, we talked about exercise and um, service to God. So today we are going to start lesson five. All right. So I want you to run and get your Bibles and turn to Nahum chapter one, verse seven. And Nahum chapter one, verse seven says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. All right. Now. I'm sitting here in this tent. And how many of you would say, man, I would love to live outside with no protection. Not even this tent, but not just for a few days, but for all of your life. Would you like to live outside during the tornado storms, during the hail, during the rain, and all that with no protection? I don't know about you, but I don't wanna do that. So I am very thankful for a house that can protect me from those things. So we are gonna see how there are four things that are beneficial in living in the house. Let's look at these four things. All right, guys. So we see the first benefit of being inside is you can stay dry. See outside it's raining, but I'm inside perfectly dry. (laughs) Puny rain. It can't get me wet. The second benefit of being in a house is, we've all seen this, the thermostat. And this 
can either make our house warm when it is cold outside, or it can make it cool when it is hot outside. And this is one of the important things that we have in our house. The third thing about being in the house is it can keep you safe from storms and hail and tornadoes and stuff like that. Now, sometimes tornadoes can be really serious. And if they come close to where your house is, you need to go somewhere that is built to protect you when the tornado comes. So for me, I have to come down to my basement. But maybe for you, you have a storm cellar and you'll run and hop into your storm cellar and you'll stay safe. But still, the benefit is, is that we are safe when we are inside our house or when we're inside the storm cellar when storms come. The fourth thing about being in the house is that we can stay safe from bad people. See, we got locks on our doors to make sure people can't break in. Then even better, sometimes you can even have a security system where if somebody breaks in, it starts alarming and it calls the police and they come right away. This is the benefit of being in a house. <sighs> well, we've seen how important houses are to our physical bodies. Without the protection of houses, we wouldn't last very long, would we? That's right. So let's head to the church and find out what we need to protect our spiritual body. See you there. All right, I'm glad you could join us. If you got your Bible still, let's read our verse again. It says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Did you know that there is someone that can protect you better than your house can? Yep, you said it. If you said God, that was the right answer. God is the best protector there ever um, that that ever is. And I want to show you four things that God can protect us from. And he can protect us a lot more than those four things. But these are some of the things God can protect us from. The first thing is the attacks of the devil. God wants to protect you from the attacks of the devil. The second thing is God wants to protect you from the attacks of others. Sometimes people try to attack you and God wants to be there to protect you. The, oh, sorry. The third thing is the attacks of your own flesh. This fleshly body always wants to do wrong things, and God wants to help us to make sure that we do not fall into sin. And the fourth thing is when we are going through a spiritual storm or a hard time. These are the things that God wants to protect us from. And God is always ready to protect us. But sometimes we like to run away from God's protection. We don't want uh, His protection and we don't obey His commands or the things that He's told us to do. And we often uh, don't obey Him and therefore we push His protection away and we run away from the protection that He wants to give us. I want you to think of it this way. You see this beautiful house here? Let's say that God is this house. Now we know that God isn't this house, but we're going to use it as an example. So when it is storming outside, let's say there's a tornado going on or there's a hailstorm, does your house have legs and it just runs to wherever you are and it protects you? Is that what happens? No. You see, your house stays exactly where it is and you have to run to your house if you want to be protected from the storms. And it is the same way with God. God isn't moving everywhere. He's staying exactly where he is. And he's waiting for you to run to him. And he will protect you. But many times we don't do that, do we? We would rather run away from the storm. And, I mean, we would rather run into the storm instead of running to the one who wants to protect us. When we run away from God's protection, it's like we are leaving the physical protection of our houses to go and stand in the middle of the storm. Now, 
I wouldn't leave the protection of my house to go and stand in the middle of a tornado storm or a hailstorm. But that's what we like to do with God. God has promised you, hey, I'm going to protect you. I want to protect you. But we run away from his protection. Now, I'm not saying that you can lose your salvation. If you believed in Jesus Christ, you can't lose your salvation. But if you run away from God and you push his protection away, then he won't protect you. You have to run to him. And that's why it's so important that we obey God's commandments and that we trust in him to protect us. And uh, let's look at our verse one more time to see this truth. This time I want you to read it with me. It says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Now, when you are chilling in your house during a storm, I want you to think, have I been trusting in God to protect me? Am I running to him to protect me? Or am I not trusting God? Or am I running away from God's protection? All right. I hope you have a great evening. See you guys next week. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Amen. There's one thing about Oklahoma, though. Uh, we go on the front porch and watch the storm as it comes up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let everything that hath breath. Yeah, let me do that one one more time. service. Please don't forget our upcoming schedule and the way that all works is we will continue to have our drive-in service at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Those will not be streamed, but then we will have regular services 1045, 6 p.m. and on Wednesday night at 630, and those all will be streamed, okay? And please uh, don't also, if you are only watching on YouTube and not on Facebook, if you'll go to the playlist uh, we are starting to add all of the Sunday school lessons that were over on Facebook, and you can watch them at that time on YouTube. So, amen. Let's sing another song at this time. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to stand up for this one.
because it's stand up, stand up for Jesus. Amen. Stand up. everybody. Uh-oh. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> so, so I've never officially um, pushed a pastor out of the pulpit before, but I guess I just did. You know, God has a uh, interesting way of, of doing things. It, I, I have been approached, um, and I, I wanted, to, wanted to pass this on to the church for a vote. Uh, uh, we, we as deacons, we've been approached, uh, there's been a donation of $300 given to Pastor Steve for his vacation, and they're leaving for Lake Murray in the morning. Yep. Right? Is there going to be a lot of water involved? I hope so. Yes? Okay, Samuel, you're going to have to maybe get him on a tube behind the boat or something, right? Hopefully. Well, um... So someone's approached, approached us, and they've donated $300 to go to the pastor's family, and we just have a burden as a church. We would like to raise that to $1,000. Uh, and so I've never done this before, but I think we show a – do I hear a motion? Make a motion. Okay. Make a motion here. So there we go. I'm seeing some mo- – who said what? And Danny Black seconded it. Okay. All in favor? Say aye. aye. See? We are diplomatic, and we have just given our pastor $1,000 for vacation. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, everyone. We're very, very appreciative of what you do. We love you, Pastor Steve. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for your generosity. We wanted to spend a little bit of time together as a family before Samuel leaves, and Tina's graduating on Saturday, so we had planned to, to go on a cruise, but you can see what happened to that. So now we're cruising on Lake Murray, maybe on a jet ski, yeah, a different kind of cruising. How many of you have a favorite day of the year? How many of you have a favorite day? Anybody? Nobody has a favorite day? Carolyn, what's your favorite day? Christmas? Angie? Easter. Anybody else? Favorite day? Teddy? August 30th. Is that your birthday? Okay, birthdays. Anybody else? Uh, May 15th. <laughs> May 15th is probably one of my favorite days because I know if we didn't have a May 15th, we wouldn't have a Pastor Kim. Yes, Sadie. Ooh, wow. 
Valentine's Day. I think, yes, Donna? You didn't have a favorite day? Okay, all right. Jan, did you have a favorite day? Thanksgiving. All right. Well, in the Jewish culture, there was a favorite day. And for many of them, it was called the Passover. And that wonderful day of the Passover, many, many, many people would travel to Jerusalem for the feast. And when they would get there, they would always buy a sheep and they would bond with that sheep. And they knew where they were going with that sheep. It was a time of sacrifice. And it's a little strange in our culture as Americans, but we call the Passover feast the feast. And it was a feast to remember God's giving Israel freedom from slavery in Egypt. And now, when I went to Africa, I had never seen a religious feast. Yes, I'd seen Christmas. Yes, I'd seen Thanksgiving holiday. I've seen many things like that. But when I got to Africa, I watched the idol worshipers. When it came for their times of feast to celebrate their idol, they loved that time of the year. And from the time a child is little, he's taught to love the feast days. And guess what they do on the feast days? They eat a lot of meat. And so in order to indoctrinate the people that worshiping the idols is a great thing to do, the feast was always associated with what? Good eating, right? Why do you think some of us love Christmas and Easter and we put on that winter weight? Because we're celebrating the feast a lot, right? And a lot of times, over time, people begin to love the feast and not the reason for the feast. They look forward to the food and they forget the occasion. And that's what was happening in the Jewish culture. And now Jesus steps on the scene. And thousands and thousands of lambs have been sacrificed. Thousands and thousands of lambs have suffered to cover sin, to cover sin, to cover sin. But no sin had ever been paid for and removed. It was only covered by this habitual sacrifice of the blood, sacrifice of the blood. And when we move to this Passover story, the Passover meal, we see that this was a holy feast and the Jews would eat at a table that looks something like this called a triclinium. And you know the pictures that we have of the Last Supper with Jesus sitting at a table with the guys? That's very westernized. But in the Jewish culture, it would be a very low table and you would be reclined on couches and you would be kind of laying down to eat. And then servers would come in and bring food and take food. And it would be very easy to wash people's feet at a table like this, where if you were sitting at a table like you and I have, can you imagine Jesus under the table? He'd bonk his head, right? And so this is not the way they were washing feet, but this table, you can see the setup of how it was going. And this feast was the most amazing feast. They are going to remember they went down into Egypt, some 70 people. God blessed them in Egypt and they grew to some 3 million people and they were in bondage in Egypt, in slavery. They cried out to Jehovah. Jehovah heard them and he sent a deliverer, Moses. And Moses told them on this day, you're going to sacrifice a lamb. You're going to shed the blood and apply it to the doorposts. And this is a feast that you will do every year to remember what I did for you. And so for the Jewish people, this yearly feast was a feast of deliverance from what? Slavery in Egypt. Jesus is going to take this very feast this very occasion and he's going to give the church a new feast a new reason to celebrate and it is called today the last supper he converted the passover into the communion and at this service his last supper with his men was not just a last supper it was a passover meal and he gave them a command at this meeting does anybody remember what the command is? 
at this meeting, what did he tell them? Do this in remembrance of me. You see, what we've done as I held up the bread, as I held up the wine, as I told you about what I would do, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Here's the terrible thing about us. If God does not force us to remember something, we will quickly forget it. Every time we go to the Lord's table, we show the Lord's death and remember Him until He comes. And so in this feast, there was two special elements that we want to look at. The feast was focused on an unleavened bread. Moses told them, get all the leaven out of your house. Because leaven was a symbol of what? Sin. And so they were going to eat bread, but not normal bread with yeast in it. It would be this flat bread that had no yeast. Because this bread is the picture of the sinless body of Jesus Christ. I have been to churches where they went out and bought wonder bread, or they bought a nice big loaf of bread and they tear it apart and they put it on the communion. And I tell you, I can't take it. And I put my hand on my wife's leg. I said, baby, today we're not taking the Lord's Supper. And she knew exactly why I didn't have to tell her. Because when they present bread to you that has yeast in it, and the bread is the picture of the body of Christ, you've spoiled the symbol. Because now you're saying, Jesus Christ was a sinner like me. When we go back to the gymnasium and we're taking the Lord's Supper, you're going to receive a piece of bread that's circular and has no leaven in it. And we're going to take it and we're going to break it. And we're going to remember that the body of Jesus Christ was broken for us. And this is a very important symbol in the scriptures. The symbol of the unleavened bread is a picture of the spotless sacrificial lamb. Jesus also opened to his disciples' mind to understand that as he held up the fruit of the vine, do we remember how you get grape juice? What must happen to the grapes? The grapes have to go through a process of crushing. So the grapes are put in a wine vat. And back in the Jewish times, ladies would wash their feet get into the wine vat and they would crush the wine, the grapes with their feet and they had a place where the wine would come out. And so they would literally tread the wine press and then it would leak off. And I'm telling you, very interesting to eat or to drink this fruit of the vine after you've seen someone stomping it with their feet, right? Yeah, but that is the way they got the fruit of the vine. It was through the crushing. And so what would happen to Christ's body? Yes, it would be broken and his body would be torn and crushed and the blood would flow because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And these are two important symbols. Now there was other symbols at the table at the Passover, but these are the two that Jesus said speak of him. There was bitter herbs that talked about their slavery in Egypt. But these are the symbols that pointed to Christ. So he took those symbols, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And in this Last Supper meal, he says, you've been doing this for years. But today I'm going to show you what it really means. And so what an important event when for years and years and hundreds of years, they've been celebrating the Passover, not understanding the power of the unleavened bread, not understanding the power of the fruit of the vine until it's applied directly to Jesus that he is the once for all sacrifice. What shows us that Jesus Christ sacrificed at Calvary is the once for all? What happened when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he gave up the ghost? What happened after he said it is finished and gave up the ghost? What amazing thing. Yes, Brother David said in the veil between the holy place and the holy of hosts, there was a very thick four or five inch curtain. 
and it was rent from the top to the bottom. And that was a symbol to show that the way into the presence of God had been opened. As the body of Jesus Christ was ripped and torn and crushed and His blood spilled out, He was making a way for you and I to approach God. Formerly, we could not approach God because of our sins. Abraham could not approach Him. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, none of the Jews could approach Jehovah God because their sins were only covered and not removed. That's why the veil was always there. So for the Jewish person, you could come close to God, but not very close because our sin was still there. It not, had not been removed. What wonderful thing did John the Baptist say about Jesus Christ when he recognized that he was the Messiah? Behold the Lamb of God, which what? Taketh away the sin of the world. And so all the other lambs that have ever been slain were only good for an atonement, a covering of sin. But this Jesus, He said that this blood that He would shed would make things right between us and God in a way that a lamb's blood could not make us right. And so... Today is not a holiday. Today is not a Passover feast. But today we are going to go back to the gym after the service and then we are going to enjoy a remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to examine the bread and the blood of the new covenant that God has given to us. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles because we want to read the account in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Before I begin reading at verse 22, I want to remind you, every believer should remember the Lord's death because of our selfish tendency to forget the cost of our salvation. I don't know why it is that when a first person first trusts in Jesus Christ, there's so much excitement about their salvation. The, the load of their sin is taken off and they seem to be so excited about this new relationship with Christ. But what often happens in the church, the longer we're saved, we tend to get careless and we will forget that we were purged from our sins by the blood of Christ. And so the Jews had an annual feast to remember what? Freedom from slavery. Did they deliver themselves from Egypt or did God do it? Yeah, God brought them out of Egypt with a strong arm. Did you deliver yourself from sin or were you saved by the blood of Christ? Yes. And every time we come to the Lord's table, we're reminding ourselves about something very important. That's I am not saved because I'm righteous. I'm righteous because I'm saved. I'm washed in the blood. What made you have a right standing with God? The fact that you go to church and you were baptized? No. You went to church and got baptized because Jesus made you righteous. He died for you. He washed you. He put you in a right relationship with God. In the communion service, when you hold the bread and when you hold the cup, you are going to remember, not me, Him. Not me, him. And it reminds me to examine myself to see if I'm living for Him or if I've forgotten what He's done for me. We are so forgetful. One of our favorite statements is, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. You can do something wonderful yesterday, but what about today, right? We always want to be told we're loved. If I told Michelle, hey, I told you 20 years ago I love you, what do you need to hear that again for? She starts singing to me, baby, remind me, right? Baby, remind me. Tell me again and again. It's okay. You can overdo it, all right? And this is what communion is. Communion is you remembering the cost of your salvation so you remember His love for you. So literally, when we're taking the communion, we should be hearing heaven say, I love you. I paid the debt. My body was broken so that your body could be spared. My life was given that you might have life. And that is the power of the communion service. 
So I want you to go with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to read slowly and carefully and thoughtfully to let this passage roll over our hearts and our minds. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth and he said, For I, Paul, have received of the Lord that which was also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, or the new covenant in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show or declare the Lord's death till he come. Do you see what a holy process this is? What are we doing tonight? We are showing the Lord's death. We're proclaiming what he's done for us. And we're going to do it until he comes for us. This will be a perpetual feast in God's house that we will remember. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now listen. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Before we will leave this room to go back to the gym to take communion, and we're taking communion in a coronavirus safe way. Normally we would take it right here. But before we go to the back, we're going to take time to examine ourselves. I'm not going to examine you, and you're not going to examine me, because you have secret things you do that I don't know about, and I have secret thoughts that you don't know about. But I have to examine myself and get right with God. If I have bitterness or hatred of the brother, you know the Jewish person, if he came to the temple to offer the lamb, it says if you have fought with your brother, what were you supposed to do? Go get right with your brother and then come back and, and get right with God, right? And do you know in many churches the reason we don't have victory is because we don't get right with others before we try to come close to God. It's really difficult to have fellowship with God, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's hard for you to remember you are forgiving while you refuse to give forgiveness to others. While you harbor bitterness and hatred or desires for revenge. And so we're saying, Lord, I really love forgiveness, but I really don't like to give it. You literally make it ugly because it's required of us to forgive others because we have been what? If there's ever a service that demands me to forgive people that have hurt me, it's the service of the communion. Have I disappointed God? Have I failed God? Today before I take the communion, will I apologize to God for stupid things I've done this month or last month? Yes. And if I know I have this victory through Christ to get forgiveness, why am I withholding forgiveness of others? while I ask for forgiveness of me. And we need to be careful that you don't have sins that are actually an offense to God. You have addictions and problems that you're not giving over to God and getting victory. And then we say, I want to come and have close fellowship. And the Lord says, you know, did you wash your hands before you came to the Lord's Supper? What do you mean wash your hands? Yeah, your spiritual hands. You know, when I was a kid, but when we'd come in from outside playing sports, we were playing football, soccer, fell down, grass stains everywhere. You'd walk in to eat. You didn't care about washing up. What would mom say? You're not going to sit down and eat like that. Go wash your hands. Yeah. Imagine coming to the Lord's table and think you don't need to wash your hands. You need to 
Wash your heart and wash your face and say, God, I don't want to sin to make me ugly in your sight. Lying lips are an abomination to God. An abomination is something that makes something unpleasant. For someone to take the food you love the most and then put the thing you hate the most on top of it. Doesn't that bother you? Yeah. Why will we put the things that God hates at the Lord's table? Have those on our hands. And so there's got to be in a time of examination. And you know, there's not one of us that is sinly, sinlessly perfect. So God's not saying you can't come to the table unless you're perfect. No, you just need to be right. You need to get right. You need to be right. And the communion is a time when I say, Oh God, I want to be right with you. I want this sweet fellowship at the table. And so the scriptures tells us, Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. 29 says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh what? Damnation to himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. Not showing respect to the symbol of God's body. Verse 30 says something amazing. It says, For this cause, people who come to the Lord's table on an unworthy manner, for this cause, many are what? Weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And this is not talking about the person who's sleeping in church tonight. This is the permanent sleep that you don't wake up from. He's not talking about someone sleeping in church. This is death. And so a careless approach to the table of God is, brings damnation to yourself. And so verse 31 says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Do you know if we take time to examine ourselves and say, God, forgive me, I was wrong here. God, forgive me, I'm holding a grudge. God, forgive me, I'm not loving like I should. God, I'm not forgiving like I should. I'm not living like I should. I'm letting Satan get a victory in my life. If you refuse to get right when God is offering the power of His blood that can forgive. He's given His body which was broken. If you can look at all of that and cling to your sin, that is coming in an unworthy way. Because if He has provided forgiveness and you refuse it because you love the sin, you're basically telling Him, I love the sin more than I love you. And that treats the table of the Lord with contempt. So it tells us that we must judge ourselves so we will not be judged. Verse 32. But when we are judged, we are what? Chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. <clears throat> this is a very important verse on eternal security. Do you know that if you came to the Lord's table in an unworthy way and made God so angry that He took your life, you're in no danger of hell. You know why? He said, I, I, I discipline my children, but I don't condemn them. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Right? And so this verse is warning us. We can be chastened by God, but we will not be condemned with the world. What's the difference between this world in the world of John 3.16. Because in John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world. But here it says, We won't be condemned with the world. You see, when the Bible says God so loved the world, yes, He loves every person in the world, but there is coming a judgment upon those that are not in Christ, and those people that are in the world. And because you've trusted in Christ, you come to the Lord's table, it is a very special time where you are celebrating the cost of your salvation and you want to be reminded. And so the first thing I want us to think about tonight is the bread of life that sustains us. Within the picture of the bread in the Jewish culture, bread literally stood for life. It had that symbolage. You can invite someone over to your house for bread, and that's the same thing as saying a full meal. And they broke bread together. It meant they ate a meal together. And so when we're reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting with verse 23b, 
it says that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took what? Bread. And bread in the Eastern culture was actually a symbol of life. So look at it this way. Jesus picked up the symbol of life and he broke the life and he says, this is my life. This is my body, which is broken for you. Did you hear that? Who was it broken for? For you. And so he gave his body to be broken. Jesus would actually be the broken lamb of God. He would go to the slaughter for us. I want you to see the backstory. <clears throat> when the Jews met Jesus before this day, they were angry with him and they demanded of him if he was the Messiah. And they demanded that he would prove that he's the Messiah by giving a sign. And so in John chapter 6 verse 32, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you what? The true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth what? Unto the world. You see, they were questioning Jesus. Who do you think you are? Don't you know that Moses fed the Jews with bread in the wilderness? You say you're greater than Moses? Give us bread to eat. And Jesus is like, I am the bread. Moses never gave you bread. My father gave you the bread. And that bread is nothing compared to me. That bread sustains you in the wilderness, but I will sustain you forever. And so he's moving from bread being a symbol of life to actually teaching them that he is the one. He is the bread of God and which came down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 34. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. You see, as soon as they thought there was going to be more bread, what did they want? They wanted more free bread. He wasn't talking about physical bread <clears throat> he was speaking of spiritual bread and Jesus said unto them I am the bread of what oh yes you don't know Jesus if you don't know him as the bread of life and tonight when we break that bread you're gonna hold it in your hands and break it yourself and you're gonna remember Jesus is my bread he sustains me more than my physical food and if you remember the backstory in the wilderness Jesus was starving to death and Satan said if you're the Messiah if you're God turn these stones into what bread and Jesus used the word of God and he said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God do you know for us, this is our bread? This sustains us. It is the word of God. And Jesus said he would live by that. So he said, He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. Now some of you are thinking, Hey, I've trusted Christ 40 years ago. I've eaten a lot of bread since then. Can I tell you something? Since the day I've trusted in Jesus, I've never thirsted for another Savior. I've never hungered for another Savior. I've never gone somewhere to get new salvation. You see, from the day I've trusted in Jesus Christ, my soul is satisfied with Christ. When you receive Jesus Christ, you don't go to look for Muhammad. You don't look for Hare Krishna. You don't look for another God. You don't have 50 gods in your house. You have one God and He satisfies you. He is talking a one that will satisfy you spiritually so you will never hunger for another Savior. And Jesus said, He that believeth on me, he that trusteth in me, ah, he will never hunger and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. 
A fired up Christian tells the devil, I would rather starve to death than eat out of your hands. Yeah. Because you know, Satan is always ready to give you some nasty thing. It looks good, but when you eat it, it's poisonous. And we need to be trained that it's better to go hungry than to eat out of Satan's hand. Because eat what God gives you or go hungry. It's better to obey your father than to disobey him and feel his wrath. Jesus takes a mysterious spiritual statement and makes a figurative ordinance of remembrance in the church. We're going to hold that bread. And what's really sad about Baptist churches, so often the bread is so tiny, once you put it in your mouth, you just swallow. How many of you go to communion and chew the bread? <laughs> you don't. You just, it's a little, little tiny thing you put it in. Tonight you've got a bigger piece. You're going to struggle. I know Baptists, they don't like change, all right? But tonight you're going to have a different unleavened bread and you're going to have to break it and put it in your mouth and you might have to get another glass of juice to wash it down. But it's going to be at your table and you're remembering his body was broken and since you've trusted in Christ, have you been hungry for another Savior? Have you needed another Bible or are you satisfied with the bread of life? Yes, I hunger for this always, but I'm not looking for more bread or different bread. I'm satisfied with my Savior, and I'm not looking for another. He's everything that I need. Before bread is eaten, it is usually torn into pieces. In Jewish culture, it would be unthinkable to cut it with a knife. But in our culture, we say, this is the nicest thing since what? Sliced bread. We cut it all the time. But in the Jewish culture, they wouldn't do that with a knife. Before we could receive Jesus, He had to be torn in pieces for us. When you think about Calvary and what happened to Him, the Bible said His visage or appearance was so marred that He was not recognizable as a man. And at the Lord's Supper, we're going to hold the bread. We're going to tear the bread and remember the high cost of our salvation. And you're going to remember that He suffered for you. And tonight in the back, I'm going to ask you this simple question. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? And when you take the elements, you're saying, yes, I have received Jesus Christ as my Savior. So as the baptism pictures the death burial and resurrection the communion is the symbol I have received Jesus Christ and as you take that you're saying I have received Jesus Christ I'm trusting in his broken body I'm trusting in his shed blood I need nothing else for my salvation I don't have to add my good works I don't have to add my tithe I don't add anything to Jesus my hope is in these two things his body was broken and his blood was shed and that brings us to our second symbol. Not only is Jesus the bread of life, He is the blood of life. When we speak of the human body and God forbids us to drink blood, why did God tell the Jews not to drink blood? He said life is in the blood. And He refused for us to drink blood is what he told his people. And so when we come to the communion, I want you to look at verse 25. It says, After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Well, there's a back story, and we need to go back to John chapter 6, because Jesus talked about this, in John chapter 6 verse 53 then Jesus said unto them verily verily I say unto you except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his what you have no life in you whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is what? Drink indeed. And you know, when the Jews heard this, they were mortified. This man wants us to gnaw on his body and drink his blood. Jesus was not speaking physically. He was speaking spiritually. 
Do you know that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and come to the Lord's table, and tonight when we take the bread and when we take the cup, though we have already trusted in Christ, we are publicly confessing our ongoing faith in Him. We have not changed. We have not deviated. I still believe salvation is in Christ alone, by faith alone, because Jesus has conquered death for me. And so this is a sweet ordinance of the church where we're constantly being reminded what our faith is built on so that we never forget. We are not saved by our righteousness. We're saved by the death of Jesus Christ and His shed blood. So Jesus again takes a mysterious spiritual statement and makes a figurative ordinance of remembrance for the church. When you see the grape juice tonight, you will smell it, it will smell like grape juice. But it's crimson in color and it reminds us of the blood. There are many churches that believe that as you take it, it changes actually into the body of Christ. We don't believe that. Because for that to happen, Jesus would have to suffer at every communion. Because His body would be eaten at every communion. We believe that the bread is a symbol of what He did. And, and the cup, the fruit of the vine, is the symbol of His shed blood. And we do this to remember the cost of our salvation. And so the communion is a holy time, a sacred time, made for us to examine ourselves. Every lamb that was sacrificed had to be spotless because they pointed to Jesus, the actual Lamb of God who would save us. Before a lamb was offered as a sacrifice, the lamb had to die. And the shed blood of the lamb had to be placed on the horns of the altar or on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. For Jesus to truly be the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world, He had to shed His blood. Do you realize that Jesus could not be our Savior if He hung by a noose on a tree? That would have not qualified. He had to shed His blood. At the Lord's Supper, we're going to hold the cup of grape juice, the fruit of the vine, red in color, like the blood, and we're going to remember the high cost of our salvation. Because tonight, when we go back there, I'm going to ask you, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You cannot come to the communion table with pride that I'm saved because I'm righteous. You must come to the communion table in humility, knowing the cost of your salvation came to Jesus Christ. This is a special time for the church. We're living in different days, pandemic days. There are some churches that have communion every week, and they call it the Mass. There are churches that have communion once a month. There are churches that have communion once a year. Jesus said we should not for forget to do this. He said we should do this in remembrance of Him. I was heartbroken when we came to the Easter time and the pandemic was breaking out and services were being closed and we weren't able to meet. Because every communion, what do we do? Every uh, Easter sunrise, what do we do? We take the Lord's Supper, don't we? And we weren't able to do that this year because of the strange time that we were living in. And my heart has been burdened week after week. We need to go to the Lord's table. And tonight, with joy, we will go back there to remember the cost of our salvation. I hope you're remembering tonight what it costs to save you. That all pride is put aside. And you come humbly tonight to say, Thank you, Lord for allowing your body to be broken for me. I hope you will hold the cup in your hand. It's going to be different. I know some of you are going to struggle. You're going to pour the grape juice into a tiny red solo cup. And you say, I've never done this before. It's always the clear communion cups. I know that. And this is a different time. But what is the most beautiful thing about communion? Remembering the Lord's death till He comes. The bread is unleavened. The, the grape juice is the fruit of the vine, symbolizing the shed blood. What's left for us to do is to humbly remember, I am not saved because I'm a good person. I'm saved because I have a great 
Savior. Therefore, I must testify of what God did for me. Do you know every feast in the Jewish culture was for teaching children? Because at every feast, guess what the children would ask daddy? Daddy, why are we killing the lamb? Daddy, why are we eating the unleavened bread? Daddy, why are we drinking the fruit of the vine? And I hope that your grandchildren and your children ask you questions about communion because it offers you an opportunity to share your faith with them. The communion was supposed to bring the church together to have fellowship together, believers coming together to remember what it costs for us to be saved, lest we ever forget the high cost of our salvation. Let's pray together. This is a time of examination. And I would ask each one of you, if there's anything that you need to get right with with God before you go back to have communion together, let's get it right now. Is there someone you need to forgive? If there's something you need to tell God, God forgive me, I won't do that again. What is it that you need to get right with God? Let's do it before we go to the back and remember the high cost of our salvation. stand together I hear you on the wind whispering to me in this quiet place again I have found a friend who understands me cause where you Heavenly Father, on behalf of our church, we want to ask your forgiveness. We want our church to be more passionate for you. We want our testimony to be bolder for you. When we think about the cost of our salvation, we realize we get easily distracted by the cares of this world, by fear. Lord, we need to serve you with greater zeal. Father, forgive us for not trusting you like we should and for all the worry that we bring before you. Give us peace in our hearts that we would live courageous Christian lives. 
that our children would know we have a great God because they see the way we walk with Him and talk with Him and trust Him. And even in this service, may our children see a symbol of our faith in the broken body and the shed blood. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Okay, we're going to try to move to the gym where we will take...